Welcome to the October Resident Council meeting. I'm Fran ba Baker, your president. And as always, we'll start with some words from Maria Timberlake, Vice President of Senior Living. Hi everyone, thanks uh, Fran for having me. I know you've got a lot of ground to cover today and Anthony Colombato has some announcements to share as well, so I'll be brief. First of all, I want to thank all the residents who supported the recent gala in one way, shape, or form, whether that was volunteering at the event, buying a ticket, donating toward a basket. I thought it was a lovely affair for us all to get together and um, you know, the John Knox Village community with our vendors and our business partners who, you know, are so important to our success. And I'm just thrilled that uh, the event started off our campaign to raise the roof for EMS and help us get started in building a new building for that uh, worthy team. So um, I'm very grateful to the foundation for having adopted the project and to Marsha and Gail uh, for working so hard to make it happen. So thank you all for, for your participation. Second of all, um, I guess I'm going to need to keep talking about COVID and more specifically about boosters. I wish I had details to share with you today, but I don't um, because we're not getting any clarification on what the proper protocols would be coming down from uh, the government. And so we are continuing to keep an eye on what's happening with the Moderna booster specifically um, because that would be the booster that we would administer here at John Knox Village to our residents and associates. We'll be um, putting a plan in action when we feel that we can have a concrete plan that will not change and we're not to that point yet. We also don't have any clear guidance from the government, um, from CMS or any other agencies related to any mandates that may be imposed to John Knox Village. Um, certainly we'll be compliant with those um, when they surface, um, but to this date there are no details. So we are anxiously waiting to, to pin all that down when we know the proper course of action. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you. And as Maria mentioned, Anthony Colombato is here to give us an announcement about an upcoming event. Great. Thank you, Fran. Um, when I was the administrator of the care center, uh, people would always come up to me and say, Boy, I'm glad the care center's doing well, but I hope I never have to go there. And I hear that. And so that's what we are working on on our campus is trying to create more opportunities for our independent living residents to not just age in place, but to age well in place. So you probably saw on the cover of this month's Village Voice that on October 15th at the pavilion from 10 a.m. to noon, we are doing an aging in place workshop. It's gonna be very interactive and designed for you to go to different booths and really learn about some of the things that we have right here on our campus that can keep you aging well. So whether that's village helpers, home health, outpatient therapy, or the fitness centers, there's gonna be a lot of different things for you to utilize and really kind of be a lot of fun, but learn about things that are on the campus. Um, so we hope that you'll join us. We will be talking about this at some of the different town halls over the next week or two. Um, so we hope to see you uh, on October October the 15th at the pavilion. The second thing that I wanted to announce is that we are very excited to announce we are relocating our outpatient therapy clinic from uh, the blanking on the room. Windsor. Windsor, thank you, from the Windsor room to the ambassador room. Um, and what that means for you all is it's much more easily accessible. Uh, dial our ride buses can get there and so it should be a much better opportunity to receive outpatient therapy services moving forward. So we hope to see you on the fi uh, 15th. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will go on to our committee reports. Anna Margaret, we'll start with uh, sales and marketing. Sales, marketing, and communications committee met on September the 16th. Uh, all the members were present, and Mary Beth, who is the staff liaison, and Natalie Chisholm, director of marketing, were present. And also, we were 
glad to have a new intern, Kylie Baker, uh, join us. She had just, that was her first week with marketing and she's learning a lot. Natalie and Mary Beth led a discussion with the committee about the new resident move-in process, looking to improve the process. The customer experience uh, and aiming to get residents to move in more quickly. Many ideas were discussed regarding the, who the new resident can turn to for information after move-in. Resident Council neighborhood representatives are extremely important. Additionally, the area manager, the life enrichment department, and marketing are all significant in helping new residents become adjusted in their new home in the community. Mary Beth presented the monthly sales report. August was a good month with 11 new lease sales, four more than budgeted. Of the seven villas, phase seven, there were five sales plus uh, another in September and three prospects interested in the last one. Meadows two d deposits were three with one cancellation, bringing the total to 24 versus a goal of 26. At the end of August, there were 820 paying residents on campus uh, for, individual, yeah, for independent living. The number of lease conversions compared to the number of, of uh, contracts is four to five a year, although a great year would be 10. The next meeting will be Thursday, October the 24th, 21st at 9.30 in the Manhattan Room. Our next report is from Joe Chase on the Finance Committee. Steve, Steve Segerman, Director of Finance, gave the financial presentation for August to the Finance Committee in the Missouri Room on September 29, 2021. In August, there were 14 sales, which is two over budget. On year-to-date basis, sales ahead of budget by 13 and well ahead of last year. There were 15 move-ins in August, three over budget. Entrance fee proceeds are 77% of annual goal. Leases year-to-date are 40, well above last year. The inventory for available entrance fee properties is low. Occupancy and in independent living continues to be under budget by nine and is 28 less than last year. Occupancy in the Village Care Center is 157, 22 under budget. The assisted living occupancy is 128 units, still under budget, but has narrowed the gap. Home health admissions decreased in August and are under budget by 29. Hospice census is 36 with a budget of 43. During August, revenues exceeded expenses, resulting in an operating contribution of $110,000. Investments provided a strong return in August, and even with the expected decrease in September, should remain above budget year-to-date. Year-to-date operating contribution is negative $243,000. Expenses year-to-date are below budget, which reflects the staffing vacancies. However, some of the vacancies result in lower census, which affects revenue. Days of cash on hand increased by 10 due to strong entrance fees and investment earnings. Debt service coverage ratio is favorable to budget. Net operating margin was 0.5% below budget. Challenges. Staffing continues to be one of the most significant items in the village as well as almost every senior living community. Agency usage is still over budget and we need to find a way to reduce the need for agency people. We did not get as many international nurses as expected. We continue to evaluate where we are short staffed, wages and the wage compression problems as we look forward to FY23. The Village Care Center business continues to face headwinds created by staffing problems. 
labor shortage is affecting census with another anticipated drop in September. Managed care has resulted in a drop in the Medicare rehab length of stay, which also affects census. The current VCC census is 145, compared to 199 a year ago and 225 the year before. The village has brought in a management consultant to review the care center operational-wise, both for the current budget year and FY23. Their review will include what is happening in the current market trends and help to determine the right size that still maintains our ability to support our residents' future needs. The next meeting will be held in the Missouri Room on October 27th. Martha Wood has the Health Services Committee report. The Health Services Committee met on eight, September 8th in the Administrative Boardroom. Anthony Colombato, Vice President of Health and Community Services, brought us up to date on all JKV health related areas. He was pleased to announce that there will be an aging in place workshop for residents on October 15th in the pavilion. It has become clear that too few residents are aware of the many health related services available right here on the John Knox campus. This lack of information often causes them to go elsewhere. Village helpers, village home health, outpatient therapy, and the fitness centers will have booths with information about all the services they provide. There will also be prizes and food at the event. Tammy Hoverston is the new Village Care Center Administrator. Ketty Dawson, JKV Hospice Administrator has been approved as director of the Seriously Ill Patient Pilot Program for which John Knox Village has been chosen to participate. Melanie McGraw, Home Health Social Worker and John Knox Care Coordinator is working on a plan which will coordinate primary health care with social and emotional issues to assist aging in place for all John Knox residents. In response to questions concerning COVID booster shots and vaccination requirement for long-term facility healthcare workers, Anthony said as yet they have had no guidelines from the federal agencies. Home Health has been busy as they receive more referrals from the local hospitals. There's been a recent increase of COVID in the care center rehab unit. All had been fully vaccinated and are not as sick as last year's patients. Contact tracing has not identified the source. The foundation will welcome donations for extras at the care center. It was also suggested that cards, cookies, etc., would help to brighten the nursing staff's day. Outpatient therapy is moving from the Windsor room to the renovated ambassador room, which is much larger with more parking and is accessible to dollaride buses. The new location will also have privacy spaces for discussion and certain therapies. We had a surprise visit from Marie Winter Cavillo, the new administrator of assisted living. She brings an impressive background and looks forward to being part of John Knox Village. Our next meeting will be October 13th in the Administrative Boardroom.
The report for Resident Services Committee will be given by Margie Stoll. Resident Services Committee Chair Carol Jennings reported that Resident Services Committee met on September 13th, 2021. The guest speaker was Laurie Johnson, JKV Vice President of Human Resources. Laurie was asked to speak about the process used in the hiring of associates. Advertising. Advertising continues with all usual sources, such as online boards, schools at all levels, TV, walk-in Wednesdays, employee referral, and sign-on bonuses. Application. Pre-screening of application and look at resume, followed by behavioral interviews with hiring manager and involved team members, overall rating, and decision of offering or decline. Interview. At this time, interviews are done either in person or virtual using the behavioral interview practice. Recently, a walk-in Wednesday became available when a person is guaranteed an interview on that day. Sign-on bonuses are also being offered. Onboarding includes a welcome letter, completing family care safety registry, background check, drug screen and essential function test. Training includes new hire orientation, annual all associates training, annual leadership training, and foundations of leadership. Retention, overall goal is to make staff feel like they belong. Show pride, personal responsibility in delivering excellence in all that is done at JKV, plus competitive benefits. Updates from Maria. The schedule for flu shots provided by Simbria will be available soon. If Moderna booster shots are approved by the FDA, they are tentatively scheduled for JKV at the end of October. When specific direction is received, Maria will present a PowerPoint on Channel 2, as she did for the first vaccinations for, so everyone can get the information correctly. Masks must be worn at all times in all dining areas at JKV, unless actively eating or, or drinking. Waiting for specific rules from the federal government as to wearing masks but JKV intends to be compl completely compliant. JKV staff is committed to the safety and well-being of the residents. Our next meeting will be October 11, 2021 at 9.30 a.m. in the administrative boardroom. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. As always, our committees had a lot of good information and be sure to watch this so you'll know what that information is and you can also read the minutes later on JKTV, on JKV Life. Our speaker today is Eric Scott, Director of Development and Operations. Um, as you know, we have a lot of things going on here that he's going to update us on and he's also gonna give us a little refresher on recycling at John Knox. So please welcome Eric. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I have about six hours of material prepared, but I'm gonna try to cut that down significantly. Um, I thought I would start today. I wanna get off on a running start because we do have a lot to go through. Um, we're gonna start at, yes, sir. Like this? All right. Here we go. Uh, Villas, phase seven. Uh, every year at the village, for the last seven years, we've done an annual villa program. Uh, this year, we are doing seven villas. We took 11 units out of service. Hopefully this will let me go here. Okay, and this year we're doing something a little bit different than what we've done the last two years. 
The last two years we've had the same floor plan for every unit that we built. This year we did something a little bit different. We've got three single family homes and then we've got two duplexes. Um, like I said, we took 11 units out of service. Three of those were on Craigmont. This is a picture of the old homes there. For reference, this is the Sun Valley Pool. So we came in here and we took out this unit, this unit, and this unit. These were older units that were going to cost a whole lot to uh, renovate. So we just made the plan to completely replace them with new homes. Uh, as we do with the villa program, almost every year we take out a lot more units than we put back. And one of the reasons for that is we're trying to lessen our density in certain areas. And then also, uh, you guys know that monthly service fees drive revenue for the village. We put back about the same square footage that we have before because the units are, in some cases, almost twice as large as what, what they replaced. So I think that's an interesting fact. The other two locations uh, were 605 Redbud, right here, and uh, you guys have probably noticed that's immediately adjacent to what is now the Meadows Phase 2 project site. And then we've got over here on Willow, 626 to 628 Willow, Though those were two duplexes that were pla replacing with a single duplex with those larger units like I just talked about. So what do we do different this year other than that? Uh, everybody, I think, has heard that lumber and many construction materials were pretty much at an all-time high in the spring. Uh, because of that and trying to think ahead and making sure that we didn't end up with units that were so expensive that we could not sell them uh, against our competition in the market, uh, we took out the, the uh, full basements in, in most of the units this time. The three single family homes are all going on crawl spaces. This uh, new duplex at Willow is on a crawl space. And the only full basement we have this go around is at 605 Redbud. So I'm going to show you some pictures of where those projects stand. Uh, before I do that, this 605 Redbud site was very problematic from a, uh, there was a, there's a sanitary sewer line that runs along up here. Uh, there was a code change. We, we were, thought we were trying to put the building right back on the existing footprint. A change in the code mandated that we had to move that building back about 35 feet. When we moved it back, we got into all the utilities that were on the back property line. So uh, literally starting this project about four and a half months later than we started the other ones. This is a picture of 305 Craigmont, one of the new single family homes. This is a 1,345 square foot unit. This is 311 Craigmont, uh, same floor plan, mirrored version, two houses down on the street. And then uh, 401 Craigmont would have been exactly the same as well. So here's a picture of uh, 626, 628 Willow. Um, as you can see, I think you can tell by the construction fencing, this new duplex pretty much takes up the whole site for the, the past uh, four units. And as I drove by here over lunch, they were starting to put a roof on this today. So... Um, any question on, on the villas? And if you do, I'll repeat it so we hear, hear it on the camera. Mr. Clement. Uh, yes, I think that was in the marketing report. Six out of seven of these are already under contract. Yeah, Wh which, you know, not doing the basements this year was a, was a little bit of a gamble, but it turned out to work in our favor. And when I talk about lumber prices, uh, in March, they were about double what they'd been previously. When we got into April and we started this project, lumber was up 500%. Record highs. Moving on to the Meadows Phase 2 project, I'm going to kind of skip through this a little bit, but I th there are some things that we've done differently here that I think are important to po uh, point out. Uh, one is on these development projects, on the big projects, the development process takes about as long as the construction. So we started talking about Meadows Phase 2 in December of 2019. 
I think on my second day here. So uh, this takes a long time. It starts with a demographic study to make sure that the incomes and population support the, the new project. What we did differently on this one that we didn't do such a great job on phase one we did a lot more soil borings. We found out what where the rock was underneath the soil. For those of you who have been at the village for a long time, 2016 was a summer of jackhammering uh, on a pretty continuous basis. We spent $840,000 on rock excavation in phase one. Uh, this version, we've moved the building up to a higher elevation to match it up, and uh, we spent $2,000 on rock excavation. So big improvement there. So, we're under contract with our architect that's the same as last time, our development partner that's the same as phase one. Civil engineers new to the, new to the project, but the same civil engineer that we used at Valve 400. Interior design firm is the same as phase one. And the architect in this scenario uh, holds the contracts for the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing engineers and the structural engineer. And I thought this would be a pretty good picture. This is, uh, this is one of about 13 elevations that are in the contract drawings. This one is important. I'm going to see if I can even blow that up a little bit. Uh, this is interesting because it shows the connection to the existing building. So I'll walk you through this drawing a little bit. And I guess to put things in context, this is one drawing that was probably eight of the other ones on the, on the page with this. And you look at the level of information around, and that's one of 360 pages in, a, in the set of drawings. So... It's a, it's a large volume of material. Okay, looking at this, this elevation, this is the east elevation of the building. Right here in the hashes here, that's the existing Meadows East building. So what does this drawing tell us? Well, this uh, tells us that the finished floor elevations for the new building are exactly the same as Meadows East. That's gonna tie in together. These three windows are all located in corridor, corridors that will connect the new building to the old building. Over here, we have a, a front door, and the way we have this located, and I should point out at this point, um, this is a picture of the east elevation of the building. It's actually, the building turns, there's a little bit of a knuckle in it, and the rest of the building is this size again. So we located the entry here, to where it kind of looks like a central and main entry for the entire building. Ten years from now, nobody will remember what was phase one and what was phase two, and we'll just have a very large building sitting here. Um, right here, we have garage doors that are the entry to the uh, parking garage. Um, this scenario, this is a retaining wall. Uh, this scenario is very similar to what happens at Meadows West if you looked at the, that building from the other side. The garage entry is at grade or at ground level. There's a retaining wall and then all of the units will walk out into the grass. So everything, this, this grade elevation continues around the entire building. Um, I wanted to walk through a few things here. Okay, I already said the first floor elevation is the same. Everything here, so you see the entry to the garage doors. This is also this line here. This is all garage to the end of the building. And then there's a, a west wing of the building that juts out into the, the Meadows courtyard that I'll show you in plan view here shortly. Um, 52 apartment unit buildings, um, 40 two bedroom units, 12 one bedroom. Like I said, we've got the main entrance kind of centrally located. There are two elevators in the building. There's one right inside these doors because 
The uh, elevator at existing Meadows East is at the far end of the building, so we tried to centrally locate those. There's a second elevator in this building that happens uh, right out here as the building turns and goes further to the north. Um, connection occurs on all three floors. Like I said, we'll notice that the new building is two full stories taller than the existing building. So that's a little bit of a change. And again, all of that was to raise the building up out of the rock so we didn't spend another million dollars on rock excavation. A uh, higher percentage of this, these are indicating uh, screened in porches. There's a higher percentage of sunrooms and screened in porches in Meadows Phase 2 than there were in Phase 1. Uh, and all that was based on marketing decisions. Um, Parking, 52 stalls underneath the building. That's different than Meadows West. There's, there are only 32 because it's only part of the floor plan that has the garage parking garage underneath. And then on top of that parking, and I'll show you in plan view here in a second, um, there's also two surface, small surface lots. There's one, uh, actually I'll go down there and show you that. I'll show you that in a second, but I'll talk about this first. Getting that a little bit smaller. There we go. So this pick is from last Thursday, and what we're looking at here, at the north end of Meadows East, on the third floor, there's actually a webcam that we have mounted that's looking at the project and taking pictures all the time about every 15 minutes. And at the end of the project, we'll have a pretty cool time-lapse photography that anybody can view. Okay, looking from here, so this is looking at the out the north end of Meadows East. We're looking at the new building, which goes, and this is kind of a, this camera is a little, gives a little bit of a fisheye effect, but there's a cutout. This is where the garages are. You can see there's rock laid out here. That's to the entry to the garage so they can access the garage during construction. The building goes up here, up here, up here, all the way to about right here, comes back around, and then this is that west wing that juts out into the Meadows Courtyard that I was talking about. So, what's going on in this picture? Um, well, it, I'll first show you this picture. This is, what the, this is what the building looked at about three weeks before that. These are concrete foundation walls, interior columns. Uh, this is that elevator I was describing, that front door is right here. This is a stairwell, this is a stairwell. This is actually a nice size storage room. So they poured all the concrete, got done with that, I think about September 8th. Then they come in, the, a big part of these projects with the underground parking garages is the the tw the 12 or the 15 inch thick concrete deck that goes over the top. So all of this work that's happening here has to do with the structural deck for the building. Um, at different times, people have talked about the, the cost of uh, the parking stalls and the garages. Um, this is what drives this, because this, just doing this 15-inch structural deck over the length of the building, it's a, a little over $500,000 worth of work. So that's interesting. To, yes, sir. Fifteen inches thick. That's exactly right. So, uh, other things. Um, you notice over here, um, everybody has probably seen reinforcing still laying on the ground or somewhere at the some point. There is reinforcing still included in this 15 inch concrete deck. There is also post tension cables. So that's, it's a different, uh, higher strength form of uh, reinforcing the concrete. These cables that come out in bundles like this get strewn from one end of the building to the other. The concrete is placed on top. After the concrete cures for three days, they come out and pull those cables uh, tight by applying about 5,000 PSI of, of pulling force. That's what allows you to have the larger spans in the parking garage. So I think that's good unless you guys want me to really go into the weeds. <laughs> um, 
moving on. So right now the project is moving ahead pretty much according to schedule. Uh, the contractor that was awarded gave us a contract in, in mid-March when we awarded the project. Uh, they're pretty close if you consider the weather days we've had today. Um, the one big hurdle that we are struggling with right now is they added a water line to the project during the last version of the city review. This is the plan view I was talking about showing you guys. This is the building. This is okay. This is the connection to existing Meadows East. This is an outline of the building here, and then this is the new parking lot. Uh, you, you roll into the garage right here. I think there are 11 or 13 spaces right here. And then another about that many, same amount of spaces in the connection of Hope Lane. Hope Lane is being reconnected with the project. Um, not because we wanted it to be, but because it has to be. Uh, city fire code requires that they can get to every elevation of the building on a paved surface. So. Um, at, at one point in the past, Hope Lane was cut off and made into these cul-de-sacs. Now this road will once again reconnect. We took the opportunity to add some angled parking. Um, also, that it will be happy news to the residents that live on the two Hope Lane cul-de-sacs included in the project. Not only are we going to do new asphalt for the new section of road, we're also going to mill and overlay the existing asphalt. So this whole street's going to look new by the time we get done. Okay, the water line I was talking about runs from, this is the intersection of O'Brien and Moore. Um, this water line goes from here, past the project, up Hope Lane, follows her Hope Lane, gets to Peace Parkway, takes another left, and then continues on to about exactly the intersection of Peace Parkway and Jacob Drive. That's a bl about 1,400 linear feet of new water line. The problem being right now with all the supply chain issues that we're facing in the world, normally a water line of this size would not be a, a big hurdle in regards to procuring the parts and pieces, but right now we're having a heck of a time trying to find those. We've been in the middle of this process for about three and a half months. So hopefully on Wednesday we're going to hear from the city and we're going to get a little help on procuring those materials. Um, other than that, that's basically the project's moving uh, pretty much on the pace that we anticipated and the current completion date is August 11th of 2022. Um, Waterline activities. Uh, oh, n another nice part of the Meadows 2 project is the O'Brien parking lots that if you guys have driven down that way recently, you've noticed are pretty much, they're open now as of today and pretty close to being completed. We demoed the existing six units on the south side of O'Brien and removed the old parking lot that was in pretty bad shape. It had 13 stalls. We kept the existing creek bed that runs through the site because we thought it would make a nice landscaping feature and messing with that would have caused us to have to go in front of the Department of Natural Resources, which is a very time consuming and, and uh, cost consuming endeavor. So we did that. Uh, we replaced the handrails on this, this existing pedestrian bridge that, that came from the old parking lot for the, or the I, I think, guess that was just units over here on the west side of the site. We replaced those handrails. We'll keep that in place over the creek bed. And you can see all the, this is actually the landscape drawing for the parking lot. You can see all the new trees and shrubs around there. All of those are installed at this time and we're hoping to get sod on Wednesday or Thursday this week. 30 new parking stalls in the east lot, 18 new stalls in the west lot. Uh, there was a notice, a new parking map that was issued late last week. Um, this will be associate parking furthest away from the buildings in both lots. And then the other, all the other parking stalls will be resident and guest parking. There's a picture of that lot. I think that was Friday morning. Gray day, like I say, all the plantings and everything in, the only thing we're missing is the sod in this picture. Oh, I should talk about the crosswalk. Yes, new crosswalk with the flashing beacons installed right here, which may look like a weird place to put it, 
but it's actually, if you take for the sidewalks here and the sidewalks on the north side of O'Brien, this is actually the quickest place to cross and get to the front door of the, the Meadows Commons building. But yep, finger button activated. Okay. Okay. Talking to the microphone. Oh, the question is: Is the crosswalk is the are the flashing beacons hand activated? And they are. You push a button to activate. You're welcome. Okay, Meadows 2 we talked about on top of that and we've advertised this in the Village Voice and I'm certain probably in these meetings in the past. On top of the, the money that we're spending on Meadows Phase 2, we included another $4.3 million of money in that financing package to do other projects around the village. So I'm going to give you a quick overview on those. Uh, one of them that's already actually been done because we made a decision you know, I think in February of last year to go ahead and do the work and then pay ourselves back out of the loan is the renovations to the VAL 100, 200, and 300 corridors. Like I say, I won't bore you with all the details here. Again, the design process takes up a, a good portion of the work. Uh, we put the project out to bid. Uh, bids came back very well compared to budget. That's, and that was about the time that uh, COVID was getting really bad in that building and elsewhere on campus and elsewhere in Lee Summit. So we decided to put off the start date for the project. We moved it from November all the way to February of this year. So that was one of the decisions we made. And I'm going to switch over real quickly here and show you some pictures. Now you guys are going to think that we doctored these photos because the before and after look so different, but we didn't. That's a picture of an existing corridor. I believe that's Val 100. Before, after. New carpet, paint on the walls, painted the trim, added new LED light fixtures. Big difference. Hold your applause, please. And yes, these pictures were all taken uh, before the artwork. And we spent about another $65,000 on artwork for the project. Mail room, not that great of lighting, kind of an old out of date decor, brand new. And this, you, you can just barely see there's a, a counter to go through your mail on the other side there. So again, new lighting, new flooring, painting. Uh, we spent a total of $1.3 million on the project. And we feel like we really stretched it quite a bit. Big impact. Uh, we also updated the nurses station. This is the, Val, the 200 nurses station. Old outdated, new cabinets, new countertops, new shelves, lights, paint, flooring. Uh, this is the old uh, bird aviary in Val 300. Um, kind of blah, not a lot of color. More color in the carpet, fresh paint on the walls, uh, really created a, a, a very uh, vibrant atmosphere over there. Couple more pictures. This is the library, new carpet, new cabinets. Here's the ambassador room that we were talking about, the new outpatient, uh, outpatient therapy room. The old room over here, we had the wood floor over there that was getting kind of beat up. Uh, now we have uh, LED lighting, paint on the walls, and new flooring. And new windows. Very good. Close that down, roll back here. Uh oh, went back to the top. That's like my own time-lapse photography there. Okay, back here. So we talked about that. Um, the point of the, the Val Renovations project was to make the corridors and the old building match the new corridors in the Val 400 project that opened up on January 2nd of last year. I think we were successful in that. On top of that, we had a little money left over. So we spent that updating the Val 100 courtyard. It, this, this was uh, before, 
some weeds and some torn up concrete and now we have a brand new concrete patio, new landscaping, new sod, and hopefully before the end of the year we'll have some new outdoor furniture. It's been ordered but being delayed just like everything else is right now. That's just one of the projects from the Meadows 2 financing uh, project. The other one that I think is going to be a big hit is improvements to Peace Parkway. Hold your applause. Yes, ma'am. Oh, we did. I should have gotten a picture of that. Yes. That's a good point. We did change that we also upgraded the Porta Cachet entry to, to Village Assisted Living. All right, Peace Parkway. Uh, I think everybody who's lived here for a while know it's in pretty bad shape and getting worse all the time with all the construction traffic that we're putting on it. We ha it hadn't been touched for a long time because we thought it was going to be way too expensive to fit into any one fiscal year in regards to capital. Um, what we did that changed, kind of changed the game was we talked to a civil engineer starting last year and came up with a different plan for replacing and improving the road. I got some laughs on this in a town hall meeting, so I said if you drove your car too fast on Peace Parkway, this would, is how it would end up looking. This was actually a, a car that ended up parking in front of my friend's house, though. Okay, so we started talking to a civil engineer. He said, why, why would you tear up all that ground that's been settling for 30 years? Let's leave that, repair, the pet, repair areas that need to be repaired, and then go back and do a full two inch mill and overlay. So that's what we're doing. To test out that theory, we did uh, something very similar last year, last July, we replaced this road that goes from prior to uh, the JKV Garden, runs along the, the north side of the Village Care Center here. We did that, it came out great, and it's uh, withholding the construction traffic that we're, we're putting on that right now. We did the same thing last October at Rose Court. We replaced the road from Shamrock all the way down to the connection to places. Both projects were successful and showed us that for instead of $2 million, we could make the Peace Parkway improvements for more in the neighborhood of 600000 So that's what we did. That's what we're doing. Um, like I said, 600000 bucks, and we're going to start spending that this week. Um, the contract, the concrete uh, contractor is supposed to be on site Wednesday or Thursday. We're going to start tearing out curbs and sidewalks. This is a section here. Um, this is Villager. This is Peace Parkway. It connects to Prior here. Goes up here all the way down and then connects back at Courtyard Cafe. This is the first section. Because we have so much asphalt work to do uh, next year to coordinate with the completion of the Meadows 2 project, we wanted to get an early start on the concrete because Scheduling these contractors is just as difficult as the supply chain issues right now. So.